seated. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving for living, giving people talents, Lord, and using them to help other people. Thank you for our senior pastor, Dr. Anthony Langley, and our worship pastor, Dr. Bobby Stevenson, our youth and missions pastor, Reverend David Johansson, our children's director, Mrs. Vicki Gates, and our church secretary, Mrs. Faith Stearns. They keep East Newton Baptist going in your name, for you are head of the church. May you bless each one. Lord, you are the creator of all things, our sustainer as we live our lives. Thank you for all you do for us every day. Please bless the sick, this offering, and this service today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, glory. Wait, what? Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Okay, good. I was just checking. I was a little concerned there for a minute. It's good to see everyone today. Hey, listen, I got some news for you. We had 223 in Sunday school. Good job. Apparently, you did invite your friends and your neighbors and your mama and them and everybody. So we're glad that you are here today. And we're glad that you've chosen to be in our worship service. If you're our guest today, we're especially glad you're here. And we're glad that you have made a point to be a part of our worship today. And we want to ask you to fill out a, a, one of those yellow cards in the pew back there. Uh, and then you can drop it in the offering plate when it goes around. That way, we can have a record of your attendance here today. You can also put any prayer requests you might have or any questions you might have about the church on that card. And we'll be sure to try to get back with you as soon as possible. Well... Y'all ready to keep worshiping? Yeah. All right. Well, let's take this opportunity and stand with one another in fellowship. Tell someone hello today.
Father, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time in your house as we worship you in spirit and the truth. Bless this, continue, dear God, to bless this church and never remember that we'd walk with you each and every day, that we'd be blessed when we walk with you. Thank you for this time and this beautiful day that you've given us. Thank you forever and forever because you are the great I am. You're the master. You're the savior. You're the one who keeps our soul from day to day. And you're the one who blesses us. Now this morning, dear God, if there's someone here that don't know Jesus as Savior, let this be the day because tomorrow might never be. Thank you. Bless this day and keep us close to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
of us who can boast only in the cross have our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The next song is just simply a testimony. It says, this is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all day long. Today, if you don't have that relationship, may today be that day that you know who our Lord and Jesus Christ, uh, he's, our Savior is. Let me ask you, stands, we join together singing my story.
with nothing left to give oh the shape that we were in and just when all hope seemed lost love opened the door for us The grace of God is overwhelming. To know that no matter where you've been, His grace will find you. Let's pray together. Father God, we come before you today boldly approaching your throne. We thank you, Lord, that, that it is through the blood of Jesus that we can have a relationship with you that we can have our broken hearts mended, we can have our hurting souls soothed by the balm of grace. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that as we come to you today, Father, that we get the opportunity to celebrate and worship you with our very lives 
after we've come to know you as Savior, Father, you use us in your kingdom to reach others for Christ, to take that very same grace that changed us from the inside out and, and communicate that grace to other people, to love other people into the kingdom, to share the love that we have in Christ with those who are hurting and broken. Now, Father, as we enter into this time of sermon uh, and, and study of your word, I pray, God, that you will just use the words of Scripture to penetrate our very hearts, to penetrate our very lives, and to cause us to be more like you each and every day. Father, to change us, again, from the inside out, not from the outside in, not the behavior on the outside that creates the change on the inside, but, Father, the real discernible noticeable change that takes place on the inside of the human being that is wrought by the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray that it increases our righteousness in this world, our boldness to follow after Christ, and Father, makes us more like Him each and every day. Now, Father, we pray for the reading and the study of Your Word and pray that You'll bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, we are continuing our study in the book of Colossians. We have seen that in the book of Colossians, Christ is everything, that he is the preeminent Christ who is above all, who is sufficient for all. There never needs to be anything added to what Christ has done to make us any more saved than what he does in our lives. And so we are called as Christians because of what he has done for us to die with Christ to our old selves, to be buried with him in his likeness, and to be raised together with him in a new life where it is Christ living in us and through us and causing us to, by very nature of our transformation, become more like Christ every day. It's a novel concept. Christians should look like Christ. Christians should be different from the rest of the world, those who have no hope and those who who do not have Christ. And so then, as we set our mind on the things above, we will be able to put aside the things of the flesh. We've been looking at the last few weeks this idea of uh, putting off the old self and putting on the new. But you'll remember that we said that you can't put off the old self, that is, put sin to death, that is, die to the old sin and the old way, until you first seek Christ. Seeking Christ is the way to put that to death, and seeking Christ is the way then to put on those things, those garments that Christ calls us to have. And, and so we looked at a couple of weeks ago and the week before that, the putting off or really uh, the analogy that Paul uses here is the stripping off like you would strip off dirty, filthy clothes. And then the putting on last week in a sermon entitled Suit Up, we talked about some of the traits and characteristics that we are to put on as Christians. Well, this morning, we turn a little bit to a little bit different, uh, the general doctrinal things that we must understand that we are to put on outwardly. So, so there are some traits that we are to put on, and then our outer garments, like our coat, are to be the things that we're looking at today. So you may call this sermon, Suit Up Part 2. You know, you have to put on those things like uh, kindness and gentleness and meekness that we talked about last week, but then the things that we look at today will be the outer garments. And it's really Christ-centered living. So, so read with me in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15. Colossians chapter 3 and 15. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's word. He says this, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. And let, uh, and, and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Father, we thank you for the study of your word. We pray, God, that you will bless now the preaching of it and use it to change our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. 
One day, Billy and Ruth Graham were driving through a long stretch of road construction, and we know exactly what that's like, right? Uh, driving through road construction just seems to be a part of our everyday lives around here. But they were driving through a particularly long stretch of road construction, and they had numerous slowdowns and stops and detours along the way. Finally, they reached the end of all that difficulty and smooth, freshly paved pavement rolled out in front of them for miles. And there was a sign that said, End of construction. Thanks for your patience. And Ruth commented to her husband that day that those words would be fitting instructions for a tombstone. End of construction. You see, we need to understand, like Ruth Graham understood, that we are all still a work in progress. I think some Christians sometimes get that backwards. They think just because they have Christ, they have somehow arrived. They have somehow become God's gift to Christianity. But here's the truth, and we learn it from when we're very little. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. You remember that? Yeah, keep singing. I hear you. Paul concludes his look at what a new life should look like by giving three main concerns that should be the focus of every Christian life. And like I said before, these three concerns are really the outer garments of our Christian walk that guide every single part of our lives. So while these specific traits should be a part of our lives, the real guiding principles should be these things laid out in our three verses this morning. As we look at them, pray that God will help you to have a life that reflects exactly what Paul is teaching in our text today. And so the first of the three is the fullness of his peace. The fullness of his peace. The peace of Christ is unlike any other peace the world has ever known. Look at verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Shortly before his death on the cross, Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So then the question comes, what is the peace of Christ? What does it mean to have the peace of Christ in our lives? Well, the peace of Christ brings two forms of peace. The first peace is peace between us and God. The peace that comes by reconciling the relationship that was broken between us and God. And so God, first of all, creates within us a peace between him and us. When we are lost, the Bible teaches that we are enemies of God. In fact, we are even hostile to God. And you may say, well, I don't remember a time when I was lost that I was ever hostile to God. But my friend, when you are only serving your own self and only seeking to fulfill your own desires, that is hostility against the creator of the universe who created you and saved you and tells you how you should function in this life. And so we are, in fact, hostile to God, as the Scripture teaches. And so, as a result, our relationship with God is broken, and we need peace and rec reconciliation that we've sung about all morning. The peace that comes to the rich and the poor, those who are doing well and those who are broken, those who are rich and those who are poor. Did I say that? I don't, I don't remember what I said. But anyway, everybody. It comes to everybody. And so that's the grace that is coming to everybody, and, and, and yet we need this peace and reconciliation, but we seek to feel this longing for peace and reconciliation, this longing for grace that we have in our hearts, in our lost state, with everything else. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. 
That's what we seek to fill up that longing that we have in our lives. And so people are really, as the old country music song says, looking for love in all the wrong places. They're looking in their relationships. They're looking in their bank accounts. They're looking in their careers. They're looking in their children or their grandchildren. They're looking all over the world for that longing to be filled by some form of grace, but the only form of grace that can really fill is Jesus Christ and Him alone, and then He will give you the peace that you are looking for. And so, when that peace and that grace washes over us that we've sung about time and time again today, we are no longer enemies of God, but we are called friends of God. He gave us the right to become children of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. There's no one in this room that deserves to be with God for all eternity. Every single one of us deserve hell. And yet God, who is rich in mercy and love, has sought to provide the peace that only he can bring in our lives. And so the peace of God is what we have. But secondly, he brings us a peace that can rule in our hearts. We recognize that not only are we are to be at peace with God, but we're to be at peace with other people. Anybody want to say amen? amen? Listen, I know we talked about it last week. There are some people that are hard to be at peace with. But God has called us to be at peace with everybody. God has called us to be peacemakers. Not just peacekeepers. A lot of people are peacekeepers. They just keep quiet so they can keep the peace. No, God's called us to make peace, to actually make peace, to go out and manufacture the peace between us and someone else. Not just keep the peace, but to be at peace. This word that is translated rule here is the word that could be used to talk about an arbitrator or an umpire. We know what an umpire is, right? That may be a better way for us to understand it. What does the umpire do besides make bad calls? Huh? He maintains order, but he calls the game. He calls the game. And that's what God is doing in our lives. He's calling the game, if you will. He's calling the shots. And so, listen, God is better at calling the shots than me. And God is better at calling the shots than you. Hopefully that's not a new revelation for you this morning. If it is, I'm available for counseling. We could get you straightened out. But God is the one that should call the, the plays in our lives. And sometimes he has to call the flag on us. And when he does, we need to recognize that and allow him to guide the game in our lives and make the calls. And that's the peace that comes from Christ. Peace with God, peace with others. There's an old story that comes out of the Salvation Army. There's a lot of good Salvation Army stories over the years, but in the last century, it tells of a strong-willed woman who had been named Warrior Brown. Warrior Brown. She had a fiery temper, and if anyone ever crossed her, she would become belligerent and enraged and lash out at them ferociously. And especially when she had been drinking, she would particularly do that on a greater scale, like it's like cubed or squared or cubed, probably cubed. She would, when she was drinking, she'd just go crazy. But one day, she found Jesus. One day, she was converted, and her entire life was wonderfully changed by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. At one open-air meeting a week or so later, she was telling everyone in a personal testimony what Jesus had done for her. There were some in the crowd that she had hurt over the years, some in the crowd that she had lashed out at, and they couldn't see how Christ could make such a a vivid change in her life. And so someone from the back of the room hurled a potato at her and hit her. Before, she would have lashed out and gone down there and told them something and maybe even more. But she simply picked up the potato, and put it in her pocket. A couple of months later, 
they had a meeting called Harvest Festival where folks would bring things they had fixed in their garden and they had a meal. This dear lady, formerly known as Warrior Brown, brought as her offering a sack of potatoes. And she explained that after that open air meeting, she picked up what she called the insulting potato, went home, cut it into pieces, planted it in the ground, and this was the harvest from that potato. It's a cute little story, but just gives us the idea that peace should be ruling in our hearts. And you say, well, I've got a temper. Well, God can fix it. Well, I lash out at people. Well, God can fix that too. Because we have no right to have animosity in our heart or anger in our heart towards someone else when God, who has every right to have animosity in his heart toward us and wrath poured out on us, has forgiven us and loves us in spite of ourselves. Let the peace of Christ dwell in you. Next, the concern that we should have is the power of the word. The power of his word. Look at verse 16. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in our hearts to God. How do we let the word of Christ dwell in us? Well, I'm going to give you the first step, okay? The first step to allowing the word of Christ to dwell in us is to know the word. If you don't read the word and study the word of God, then you can't know the word and it can't dwell in you. The Bible is really not all that hard to understand. I've talked to people over the years that say, you know, I, I, I have trouble understanding the Bible. But it's really not hard to understand. There's definitely some passages that are difficult. Maybe it's because of the, the cultural differences between that time period and, and now. Uh, maybe it's that, you know, it, it's big long words or something that you're not used to reading or you're reading some of these names and you have trouble reading that. There are definitely some passages that are hard to understand, but there's also plenty of passages in the Scripture that are exactly what they say. You can't really misinterpret them because, you know, when they say, don't be angry, don't be angry. Mark Twain put it in perspective when he said, most people are bothered about those passages of Scripture which they cannot understand. But as for me, I've always noticed that the passages in Scripture that trouble me the most are those which I do. But just because you read God's Word on a regular basis does not mean you are allowing the Word of God to dwell in you. We must read it under the influence of the Holy Spirit. We must read it being guided by the Holy Spirit. And so our Bible study must be first bathed in prayer. You want God to teach you something from the Bible as you read it? Ask Him. Bathe it in prayer. And then, under the power of the Holy Spirit, He will help us to have a more focused Bible study and Bible reading, and He will teach us. We must meditate on the Word of God. Listen, let me just tell you, when you're reading through the Scripture and you've got one of these daily plans where you're checking the boxes to get through the Scripture in a year and you say, man, I'm, I'm three chapters behind and you read everything that night, check, 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 check. That's not the best way, I don't think, to allow the Word of God to speak to you. I think sometimes you just have to take it slow. And if it takes you 13 months to get through or read the Bible in a year and you learn something, isn't that better anyway? So take a little time, and if there's a passage of Scripture that really speaks to you, read it again. Study it. Talk to a friend about it. Spend some time in the Word of God and meditate on it. Because the Bible says the Word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts us deep and reshapes us and molds us into who God wants us to be. That's what the Word of God can do. And so we are called to study the Word of God and allow it to dwell in us. We also are called to have a focus of the Word of God 
in church. That's what this passage says. Look at it again. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. So there's a, a group aspect to what we do with the Bible. So this is a church thing in all wisdom. And so we're to be teaching one another the Bible. So we're to have Bible study and we're to sit under preaching. And preaching should be a central portion of the worship service. And then he goes on to say, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts. Now, typically, we know what the Psalms are. They're books in the Bible, and there's lots of songs in our world today that are based on Psalms, and we try to incorporate those in the worship service. You know what hymns are. Hymns are structured testimony songs about God, and then spiritual songs are worship songs where we sing to God. The Bible says we're to have all of those in our worship service. It's, it's an important, because hymns kind of sometimes are, are real theological and real structured and help us to remember theology, whereas worship songs are more focused on singing to God and worshiping for who He is. Now, there are some hymns that have a to God aspect, but most of them you'll find are testimony songs about God, which is, I think, important in the church as well. Here, here's the thing. When we are determining songs to sing in the church... And Pastor Bobby does most of that, of course. Sometimes I give him a request. <laughs> if they don't line up with the teaching of Scripture, that's what gets the song to boot. Because the Scripture is the measure of what we do right here. The Scripture is the measure of what we focus on in this worship hour and 15 minutes. And so we are to let the word of Christ dwell richly in us. Number three, the greatness of his name. Look at verse 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This command is comprehensive. It includes both the words that we speak and the deeds that we do. Everything we do should be focused on magnifying and glorifying the great name of the God of the universe. Deeds include all actions, including teaching and preaching and working and vacationing and doing laundry and doing yard work and cooking and whatever it is you do, God calls us to do it all to the glory of God. Words include everything, listen, that passes through our lips. Everything. If you can't say amen, say oh me. <laughs> our actions and our words must Focus on what Jesus is and does, and we should be conformed to him. We must live our lives in a way that glorifies God in heaven. In his book, I Almost Missed the Sunset, I don't know if anybody's read it, Bill Gaither writes, Gloria and I have been married a couple of years, and we were teaching school in Alexandria, Indiana, where I had grown up. And we wanted a piece of land where we could build a house, and I noticed there was a parcel of land to the south of town where cattle grazed. And I learned that it belonged to the 92-year-old retired banker named Mr. Yule. He owned a lot of land in the area, but he said he would never sell any of it because he had promised the, the cattlemen that they could use the land for their cows to graze. Gloria and I visited him at the bank. Although he was retired, he always spent a couple of hours each morning in his office. And he looked over the top of his bifocals, and I introduced myself and told him that we were interested in a piece of his land. He said, not selling. I promised it to the farmers for grazing. He was pleasant enough. And I said, I know, but we teach school here and thought you'd be interested in selling to someone who was planning to settle permanently in the area. He looked at me for a moment, pursed his lips, and said, what'd you say your name was? He said, Gaither, Bill Gaither. Hmm, any relation to Grover Gaither? Yes, sir, that's my granddad. Mr. Yule put down his paper and removed his glasses. He said, very interesting. Grover Gaither was the hardest working human being I have ever had the privilege to know. He always would say a full day's work for a full day's pay. So honest. What did you say you wanted? <laughs> Let me do some thinking on it. 
then come back and see me. Came back a week later, Mr. Yule told me that the property had been appraised, and I held my breath knowing what it should appraise for. He said, how does 3,800 sound? Would that be okay? I thought to myself, if that was 3,800 per acre, that would be about $60,000, and I just couldn't afford that, so my heart sank. He said, 3,800? Yep, 15 acres, 3,800. He said, I knew it had been worth at least three times that, but I readily accepted, and we bought the land and built the house. Nearly three decades later, my son and I strolled on that same beautiful, lush property that I'd bought so many years before that had once been pasture land, and I said, Benji, you've had a wonderful place to grow up through nothing good that you have done, but because of the good name of a great granddad that you never knew. Everything we are as Christians and everything we do reflects upon the Lord. Our name, our actions, our words, and our deeds reflect upon the Lord. And the Lord's work can do amazing and great things. But only when we are functioning according to His will will those things impact our lives. Only when we are doing what he has called us to and putting on the garments of Christ like he's called us to. We are to be full of God's peace and live at peace with all men. We are to live a life full of God's word and allow it to richly dwell in us. And we are called to live in a way that our lives fully and gracefully reflect his name. It has been said, that you can tell if you are carrying a full bucket of water if your feet are wet. Well, I say to you, is your bucket of Christ full or your feet wet? Is the goodness of Christ spilling over onto you? And are you reflecting it to the world? My friend, dwell in the fullness of peace and the power of his word and the greatness of his name. If you're here this morning... We're going to have a time of invitation in just a moment. I want to ask you to do a few things. First, if you have never entered into a relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to come forward and talk to me about how you can be saved. Jesus has given his life, and nothing good dwells in you, but through Christ he can save you and make you his child. And then the Holy Spirit will dwell in you and live through you. It's all about Jesus. Number two, if you're here this morning and you are a Christian that has not lived at peace with others, or maybe you don't recognize your peace with God, maybe today is the time that you need to repent of your sin. Maybe you haven't spent enough time in the Word of God and allowed it to dwell richly in you. This is your opportunity to make a commitment to Christ that you will begin to spend more time in his word so as to allow that word to dwell in you richly. And perhaps it is you have not been focused on making God's name famous in the world by living a life that reflected his goodness and greatness. It's time for you to commit yourself to do that. And every Christian I believe in here could do that to a greater degree. And so today, I want to ask you to do that. Thirdly, I want to ask you if you're here today and you're a believer and you plan on partaking of the Lord's Supper in just a moment, the Bible teaches us that we are never to partake of the Lord's Supper unless we're a believer and unless our hearts are right before God. And so this is an opportunity for you to repent of sin that may be in your life. Maybe you've harbored anger for someone this week. Maybe you've done some things you're not proud of. This is an opportunity for you to repent before we partake of the Lord's Supper. So I want to encourage you, after we pray, use this invitation to come and meet God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your greatness and your grace. We thank you, Lord, that everything in our lives helps us to focus on who you are as our Savior. And I pray, God, that as we move forward through this worship service, that you will prepare our hearts to partake of the Lord's Supper. Father, use this time in Jesus' name. Amen. This altar is going to be open. Stand with us and come. As we sing, you can come and talk with me. You can come 
and pray here. Let's do business with God and prepare our hearts to worship at the Lord's table. You come. Amen. You may be seated. We come to a time in the worship service where we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. Um, I just would remind you that the Lord's Supper is for believers, uh, those who have accepted Christ as their Lord and their Savior. If you are not a member of this church, but you are a believer baptized in the church, uh, we uh, offer an invitation to, for you to participate with us. Um, and so we, we just want to celebrate together as God's church, what Christ has done. And when we celebrate this, we remember that the, blood, blood, uh, the body represents, the, uh, the bread represents the body that was broken for forgiveness of sins of Jesus Christ, and the blood is represented by the juice that we will drink. This service is in no way magical or transformative. This ser service is worshipful. 
It's a time for us to honor the Lord and reflect upon what he has done for us. It's also a time for the church to identify with one another that we have been saved and to reflect upon Jesus Christ and his great gift. And so if you're a baptized believer, we invite you to participate. Um, it's very important if you're not a baptized believer that you refrain simply because the scripture tells us there are consequences of that because you drink and, and eat in an unworthy manner. All right? Uh, so uh, let's just uh, have a word of prayer, and then we'll move into this. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Now prepare our hearts as we participate in this ceremony. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that Jesus, on the night of his arrest, distributed the bread to his disciples. And when he broke the bread, he prayed. Bread in memory of the broken body of Christ, and in obedience to his command to do so from time to time as we gather. Bless this time, O Lord, as we remember his death and resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen.
Paul says in Corinthians, For I received from the Lord what also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and distributed it among his disciples. Let us pray. Our gracious Father, thank you so much for sending your Son to us so that he can take our place. Thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus that washes our sins away. In Jesus' name.
In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And all God's people said, Amen. The Bible teaches that after they did this customarily in the early church, they would sing a hymn. So we're going to sing before we go. <clears throat> but I just want to tell you there's three great, great things about this worship service today. I believe we had a great worship service and really honored God through everything that took place. Amen. I believe that lives are being changed, secondly, through what's being preached and what's being done through this church. And thirdly, you're going to uh, get, the crowds are going to be gone by the time you get to the restaurant. So uh, let's stand together and sing a closing hymn as we depart. Please take the hands of those around you. We'll close by singing the chorus, Victory in Jesus. Oh, victory in Jesus.